Thank you all for coming. <laughs> How are you doing? Yeah. yeah, we're having, we're ready to have some fun? Yeah. Okay, good. It's going to be a little crazy, but we like it that way. I'd like to thank Charlie White, School of Art. <laughs> uh, Mary Ellen Poole, uh, our dean, is she here? Thank you for supporting my book and Center for the Arts and Society. Jim Dusing, thank you. Uh, they, thank you. And the Studio for Creative Inquiry, all of these institutions and individuals supported this book project and it would not have been possible without their generous support. Um, I think I can start now, okay. Um, quote, grand finales, unifying summaries are not my thing. Give me fragmentation, recalcitrance, contradiction, the beneficent jolt of the unexpected and the antagonistic. End of quote. These are the words of my late advisor, Linda Nocklin, and I'd like to honor her. And thank you, Linda, RIP. Oh, that's the table of contents. Um, three general structures, me, not me, me, bits. I'm not narcissistic. <laughs> that was a joke. I am. Um, <laughs> next slide, please. Oh, that's Linda Nocklin. You know, I wanted to, I have like a few pictures from my gra graduate school years just to, to just, you know, remember the journey I've had for this book and also wanted to share that with you. Why should I be writing this book? Pictures of a white man, dirty or not, promised much. In my college years, their painted, photographed, and filmed bodies in art offered me an escape from the daily horror of a Korean patriarchy that constantly threatened my homosexual self. Pleasures of those foreign pictures coincided with my study of English literature which vaunted a wholly different knowledge structure belonging to another world. Reading E.M. Foster's Morris for the first time and watching its film adaptation offered me a powerful delusion that I could free myself from the violence of Korean jocks and across the continents and oceans, I would be, I, I, I would be accepted as I was. Having studied in uh, California, Oregon, for three summers and spent a summer in Holland, I came out to my parents in 1997. Pictures by Aubrey Beardsley, David Hockney, and Andy Warhol interspersed with the centerfolds that centerfolds in Playgirl, Stroke, and XY Magazine studied fantasies of a better life in my head. Later that year, I immigrated to the United States. It took me another two decades to realize that those pictures of opposing men I admired were not meant for me, not really. Yes, I saw my homosexual desire articulated, studied, even vicariously fulfilled in sensual choreography of white men's body parts, but such spectacles entertained and sustained the white gaze. I was not an authorized participant of this narrative of a visual pleasure. There is a photograph of Paipo Wendui posing as a ventriloquist. The Filipino-American artist holds a wooden dummy miniaturizing white masculinity. Seated and cropped around the thighs, Paipo looks directly toward the camera and viewers. Clean shaven, Paipo dons a gallant accoutrement entailing a fedora, an ascot, a winged collar dress shirt, a paisley brocade, waistcoat, and a pair of dark trousers. Despite a seeming incongruity with his Asian features, 
white imagination remembers John Wayne, not John Chinaman, Pai Bo presents a flawless picture of a Hollywood Western gentleman who would frequent saloons in the Wild West, counting gunslingers and painted ladies among his friends. But he is not white. When the doll exhibits the uncanny power of a speech, whose semiotics is put to use? Who possesses the language? I would, I would like to think that Piper controls this Théâtre de Folie Dramatique. Next slide, please. So we're now going to uh, uh, two different chapters. Um, next slide, please. It's going to be, so I'm gonna be reading a part from David Hawkins chapter. Next slide, please. The perception of unmanliness as anathema and the concurrent politics of hatred had proven dangerous, even lethal, on either side of the Atlantic during Hockney's adolescence and adulthood. In 1954, Anthony Langford, for example, was murdered by a man he met at a bar on Friday night. The killer, quote, said the two had several drinks and then went to Langford's apartment. Time reports, quote, the 29-year-old insurance executive was beaten, shot in the head, and had his throat slit with a broken glass at his bachelor apartment in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. The assailant, a former sailor, claimed in court that his violent attack was triggered by Langford's indecent advance, unquote. In England, Alan Turing committed suicide in 1954 after enduring chemical castration for two years. He was charged with gross, gross indecency in 1952. Also in 1954, Peter Wildblood was found guilty of conspiring to incite a young man to commit what were then described in law as indecent act. He and co-defendant Michael Pitt Rivers were sentenced to 18 months in prison. Lord Montague, another defendant, was given a one-year sentence, unquote. In 1955, Wildblood published his book, Against the Law, detailing the horror of a being a homosexual man in Britain, and this led to the formation of a government committee on homosexual of, of, of offenses and pro prostitution chaired by John Wolfenden. The committee's findings, as presented in the in the Wolfenden Report in 1957, recommended the decriminalization of a private homosexual acts between consenting adults aged 21 and older, though it would take another, another decade for this to become enacted in England and Wales as a Sexual Offenses Act 1967. In the United States, none of the constitutional challenges to sodomy law in the 1950s and 60s were successful. As James Polchin points out, straight men proved that they were sound in mind by engaging in violent acts of homophobia. And throughout those decades, quote, as the legal defense evolved, the integrity of a heterosexuality in cases of homosexual panic depended on the reasonable man standard, which argued that any normal man would be outraged by another man's homosexual attraction or mere suggestion of homosexual interests. Such a standard justified the violent attack as a reasonable response to such an emotional and psychological threat. Homoerotic male bodies were constantly under visible and invisible threat of a harm when Hockney was in his 20s. 
this real struggle for existence contextualizes his paintings from the 1960s. In California, 1965, two supine figures, tanned except for their buttocks, float on the surface of the water as a pair. Their inclusion in the picture feels out of a place as their representational qualities appear alien to the seemingly rampant abstract patterns upon which they drift, exemplifying what Livingston calls Hockney's quote unquote deployment of contradictory modes. Place atop the relentless line work of what Hockney considered water diagr di diagrammatically observed, the bathers stretch out on inflatables in languor. For some viewers, their unclad bodies easily evoke simple, inactive leisure, but an image of a male homo homoeroticism could never be wholly dissociated from a fear of gay murder or other homosexual panic defense during any decade of the 20th century in the West. In that historical awareness, which required the epistemology of the closet in the first place, Hockney's bathers can be thought of as laid down on pool floats, evoking images of a two dead or two future dead bodies on morgue tables. Arms and legs submerged in the reticulated water appear lopped off. In the context of, a, of the modernist vision fueled by homophobia, the two buck naked men drift as if they were victims of heterosexual toxicity. But the painting does not need to be a mere expression of hidden anxiety. California surprisingly dismisses that anxiety at the same time for the composition appears crafted with a double entendre of the closet. The ostentatiously free form of the water's undulation feels codified, stultified, camouflaging the very lack of a famed bravura in kinetic machismo that for instance, for instance Jackson Pollock effectively embodied. Perhaps the two bare man only feign lifelessness so as to ironize and underscore the outmodedness or downright moribundity of patrimonial action paintings, paintings of the earlier decades, a bad example of which spreads below them now. Furthermore, these bathers prevent the discharge of a somat somaticity from Hockney's picture, never entirely yielding to, and here even taunting, the expanse of a cowboy anti-figuration and non-representation or that frontier heroism once celebrated in apprehension. Next slide, please. Oh, a uh, little vignette to Make sure that you are not falling asleep. Uh, grass school, uh, Upper East Side. Uh, it was a red party, and I'm wearing red. Next slide, please. Next one. Now we're in the Robert Gober chapter. Next one, please. Many objects in Robert Gober's earth can be read as oblique references to Oz. The artist built dollhouse that look, doll houses that look like they were lifted from the ground and relocated to the gallery floor in a strong wind. Next slide, please. His half stone house even has a storm cellar door on the left side exterior wall. There is also an independent sculpture of a storm cellar door flung wide open as if a twister is sighted nearby. Next slide, please. The path, the paths um, covered in yellow fallen leaves in the insulation forest. 
evoked a yellow brick road leading to the Emerald City. Entering this installation at the artist's, artist's MoMA retrospective in 2014 felt like spinning inside a tornado because of the hallucinatory effect of the yellow paths endlessly repeating all around the walls. Finally, next slide please, there is a Gober's young girl's shoe, right one only, made of red casting wax. Next slide please. Considering the weight and impact of the Wizard of Oz in the history of a queer visual culture, the echo between Gober's leg on the floor, placed against the wall, and the Wicked Witch of the East's legs sticking out from under an outer wall of a previously airborne house makes a fabulous comparison. Dull, ordinary shoes and sparkly red shoes mundane white socks and zany striped stockings, legs that will liquefy by fire, le legs that will liquefy by water, the crushing of the witch, as evidenced by her legs sticking out, shod in red shoes constitu constitutes, constitutes a key event in the beginning of the film. Book ending this death, this film's denouement depends on the melting of the flesh of her sister evildoer, the Wicked Witch of the West. The time structure of the film is marked by these bodily events. Goldberg's fascination with the meltable flesh and his decision when it comes to severing to cast only lower limbs in beeswax seems significant as an assertion of, an ident assertion of identity as a friend of Dorothy, sharing his unstable roster of formative imagery. Since legs and feet are central as material manifestations of, a, of the struggle between Dorothy and the Wicked Witch of the West, I'm sorry, shoes, legs and feet are central as material manifestations of the struggle between Dorothy and the Wicked Witch of the West. They attack and punish each other over the lost object, mommy's penis, because the fetishized footwear offers its owner an inestimable power and the red shoes fit them both. Goldberg's red shoe cast in 1990, next slide please, exist on its own, its mate emphatically missing, lost or stolen, and possibly in someone else's possession. It causes castration anxiety or a thrill. Little boys may become girls. In 1992, Goldberg cast the same right shoe, this time in sallow beeswax with human hair visible in the sole as though to suggest the onset of a puberty in which the shoe matures as genitals. Even older boys may lose their shoe and grow up to be women. Next slide, please. So pretty much done with the reading part. Um, little PSA, um, page 109. Uh, We need to move three words. <laughs> if she, I know it's, I don't want to, you know, come back and haunt you, like, because this, this will bother me, you know, even after my burial. If Chimabue's holy body is contained and the inner mystery of that divine temple in the flesh is sequesters from immediate ocular probing, but endlessly implied. So here I am done talking about the painting on the left. Now I'm moving to the right, Francis Bacon. Um, in Bacon's anatomy, as in an architectural rendering that is axonometric, three-dimensional without, but without perspective, the structure is sliced open to reveal the interior and the inner workings. Okay, so please make note of it. Um, <laughs> next slide, please. Um, book is dedicated to my husband, Stephen. Um, is that a question now? Okay. Uh, 
Okay, we'll talk. Yes, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I would rewrite it if I had the chance now, but uh, it's already in print. So yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, so Stephen, my husband, is he here yet? He was flying from New, uh, Boston. Was delayed. Anyway, the book is dedicated to Stephen. Stephen, is that you? Are you there? No, I can't see. Okay. <laughs> next slide, please. Oh, yeah, so um, um, uh, this segue to the next portion, um, Bruce Hanley was uh, a visiting professor in Louisville, Kentucky, and I had a conversation with him about eight years ago, 2015, about his book on Sturtevant. So in some kind of, I don't know, cosmic workings, I feel this feels very uh, significant that I can have a conversation with Bruce Hanley uh, about my book. And the next one I'm going to show very briefly uh, is a, a, a testament to good times we had in Louisville, Kenton, Kentucky, drinking bourbon and whatnot. Okay, next one, please. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, so we're going to do a little dip. We're going to go for a swim. Yay. Two, two swims in different parts of the book. Back to Hockney, because you do this very interesting thing where there's a body beneath the water that we cannot see through. It is not, it's so often the paintings of Hockney's you focus in on, the body, the pool becomes almost a crypt. And it makes me think of Sunset Boulevard, and we won't talk about that today, where the dead body floating on a pool narrates the entire film. Um, but I wanted to give an example of where we see the body or parts of the body so it's, it, it is a decision, seemingly, on Hockney's part when it's not like, oh, I can't do this yet. It's like, no, he was working on these two mm -hmm. things simultaneously. So if you could go to the next slide. So this is a bigger splash, which you make, you do a really good reading of. And as an example of, we see the splash, we recognize this as a pool, even if it's an abstract field but we don't see a body. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how, just in terms of process, for those interested in looking at art, how you came to that decision to focus in on that as what you would write about in terms of Hockney's paintings. Okay, okay, um, thank you. Wow, um, it's, it's a great question. Um, I think that I'm, I guess I'm always drawn to absence and bodies disappearing, you know, and like the strategies of um, secrecy. Um, and so there are three splash paintings and I remember seeing it for the first time in San Francisco as FMOMA, and I was just very drawn to it, but not simply because it's so, like, like ooh, it's beautiful, or it's so cool. There was something uh, disturbing about it, something that felt not quite right. And I think that that feeling of something being amiss in seemingly facile painting uh, led me to think about um, like what else is happening. You know, I, I read uh, these splash paintings as um, uh, cum shots, you know, and I talk about Bukaki and so on in the book. Um, but there is related painting that shows a young man uh, lying on bed um, and they, we have yeah, slide. yeah, that would be amazing. Um, right there. Yes, I, I realized that they were painted together, and it was actually shown together, the, the, the splash paintings and this painting. So I thought maybe there can be a way to think about them as a cycle uh, with this um, sort of interpictorial um, sort of a uh, dialogue, you know, and the idea of a plunging and the ecstasy and that the small, like, you know, a blip of your brain, the death of a pleasure, you know, all seems to be connected to the, 
the, the kind of like this continuous repetition of the three splash paintings and this one, you know. So I think that the initial sense of something being wrong uh, led me to think about them as a, as a, as a one thing, a cycle. Yes. I think a lot of, of that comes up in the final chapter. And we're going to go there very soon. Great. But we're going to take just a detour. If we could go to the next slide. I just wanted to so that after this period in California where Hockney makes a lot of pool paintings, California paintings, um, he moves into something he never fully leaves, but these double portraits. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is the double portraits. This is Henry Geltzeller and Christopher Scott in New York. If you go to the next slide. Here's another, a really great lithograph where they're supposed to be at the Chateau Marmont in Hollywood, but with a Stella Black painting on the wall yeah. and some kind of interesting rainbow communique um, going on between the two of them. If you go to the next slide. So I just wanted to like add to Jeremy uh, what you said in terms of uh, when you were talking about the Hockney paintings and about the changing of the law, the lega legality of homosexuality. And just like an anecdote specifically to um, Hockney, not that it was always bodily violence, mm. but cultural violence around even reading material. And so this is um, just a description of what's going on in the, in the Hockney quote. When Hockney was, is re-entering the UK after he's been in New York in 67, 68, um, a British custom officer seizes male physique magazines from his luggage. Hockney immediately prepares to protest. Through legal action, he personally makes telephone calls to Her Majesty's Customs and Excise, convinces State Gallery Director Norman Reed to send a letter to that office, and secures the art world of art historian and broadcaster Sir Kenneth Clark, famous for a book on the nude, um, <laughs> that he will testify should the case be taken to court. The ordeal is much reported on in the US and UK media and Hockney's possessions are eventually returned. And this is Hockney's quote. I remember they were delivered back in a large brown envelope, which would be another way of reading uh, the traffic in nude male bodies and closeness. Mm. Like the, the uh, illicit material would often come in a plain brown envelope, both mm. in England and in the United States. That that's how, uh, the postal system is a way to get for, to traffic in yeah. male nudes. Yeah. So like yeah. it becomes another way of reading the surface, the kind of yeah. blank, quote unquote blank surface. Right. Of, right. Uh, of the yeah. poem. Um, just to finish this quote, there was a list of everything they'd taken, which had been all been written down by the customs man in this incredibly repressed handwriting. Uh -huh. I think they were frightened that if I took it to court, I would win. I defend my way of life. I was prepared to defend myself because I thought, if I don't do it, who will? And if nobody does it, they just rule. Mm -hmm. So the that last slide brings a lot of these two things. If you go to the next slide, this is um, mm -hmm. a, a painting, a, a double portrait, but a double portrait of a single person person right. is how Hockney talks about it. So it's Peter Schlesinger mm -hmm. looking at himself swimming and uh, himself, uh, and I, I just, I think what's so beautiful in terms of the argument and where we're going to go next in the next clip and how you end the book is this tension between the seen and the unseen, the mm -hmm. private and the public, mm -hmm. the family life and the life outside the family and whether or not that's possible. And so you, it takes a kind of splitting of the self to be able to accomplish that. And water seems to be both lubricant mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. softener, and but also uh, potential, as you say already, in mm -hmm. terms of how you talked about bigger slash, a kind of something's always awry. Mm. Even in how we see a body, you know, partly underwater, parts of it might be enlarged, then large just because it's distorted. The yep, distorted. Yep, yep, yeah. Yep. So I think it, now we're, I'm going to show a brief clip and then we'll talk a little bit about awesome. where the book ends. So this is a, a five minute clip from Spa Night by Andrew Ahn. It's 2016, I think. Uh, probably. I, th I think, yes, yeah, 2016. Yes. Um, and then we'll talk about it. So this is the last chapter of, J of John Woo's book is on this movie. I thought these, the juxtaposition of these three scenes was so charged mm. because the central character, who's mostly in the center of the frame or working, um, thinks that he's, I mean, there are two things going on. He thinks he can keep parts of his life separate. Uh -huh. And steam itself is melting 
the walls, literally, it's literally yeah, melting yeah. the walls between these two songs. So the, the scene with the family at the kitchen table mm. is as hot as the yes. spa. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. it's, it's, and, but that conversation with his mother is about the test. Yes. And it seems like the test is both in, literally it's like he wants to get into USC. So he's gonna take the SATs, he's put time off. We've seen a scene with his, he goes to visit friends of his who are already yeah. in their first or second year and yeah. has a weekend with them. But it seemed, and then because we see the SAT book kind of molding yeah, <laughs> in yeah. his jobs locker, it's as if like the test is, is more than that. The test is whether or not he's going to be able to speak or to perform. Mm. Um, and to embody kind of desires that he, he, he clearly knows he has. Mm -hmm. And it's not, for me at the end of the film, it's not clear whether he can pass the test. Right, like, but right. there is a test and it's, I mean, there's also always a test for all of us, but, but I wonder if you could speak to the decision to end the book with this um, film and, and how you think about it now that the book, you know, just in terms of process, how would you, talk about it now? Would you talk about it the same way? Are there things you didn't get to say? We didn't even talk about, you know, logistics of writing a book like this in terms of whether an artist will give you permission to mm -hmm. reprint certain pictures, mm -hmm. which factors in, we'll put that for another time. But in terms of this film, what, there are clearly many reasons why you would go there, but yeah. it's not an obvious link, yeah. except for me, the, the bridge between Hockney and yeah. And the Andrew on yeah. works really no, well. No, very insightful questions here and comments. Thank you, Bruce. Um, no, I think that um, I love the idea of heat melting, and I talk about melting in different uh, different places in the book because, like, melting is an event of the body and the consciousness where it fails, right, is where the rupture takes place, and it seems as though when the, when the rupture takes place, that's when we truly get at least some glimpse of what's going on in relation to our notions of who our, what our body is like and our notions of what we want, you know, and um, that the, the the hysterical response, like Joseph, uh, the father, like he loses it, yeah. like his uh, his r reason fails. You know when the air conditioner breaks down in that Los Angeles apartment, and the mother is trying to like redirect the conversation. It's almost like a misdirection, mm -hmm. you know. And the SAT, SAT test is some kind of semblance of a normalcy that cannot quite uh, abide, you know, cannot quite adhere to the screen, you know. And that Hockney's body is disappearing, the legs. You can see the body coming out of or going into the pool, but once in, he, in some of the paintings, it looks like, literally, it seems like the pigment is melting into mm. this metaphorical water, you know, that um, Peter's, uh, that double image uh, is, uh, in that sense, atypical. And narcissism, you know, is one of the uh, an analytical upper, uh, uh, tools that I use, instruments I use uh, in this book, I was trying to reinvent narcissism um, as a productive uh, uh, psycho psychological structure that helps us uh, understand the libidinal relationship between the subject and the object, you know, and for me, the boundary rupturing, you know, the place where reason fails is exactly where my lessons lie, you know, and um, so I guess I keep coming back to melting and rupture throughout the book. It's sort of a like light motif, mm -hmm. and the spa night uh, gave me this an odd opportunity to pull back everything, bring everything together from preceding chapters, you know. Um, there's a body, there's a water, uh, rupture, pleasure, and cessation of that pleasure. So uh, Spa Night was really, um, it served me very well, even to organize my own ideas. Yeah. 
Yeah, my, we're gonna open it up to questions. I have one more comment about Spa Night, which I had not seen. I, so I read the book and then I was like, oh, preparing for the talk, I'm gonna watch Spa Night. Um, there's something going on in terms of Los Angeles mm. and in terms of what you're doing with powerful identifications and disidentifications in yeah, the book yeah. that the lead character in the film is worried about and he wants to he wants to go on grinder it's not clear he's on sex apps he knows oh. about them he's taking pictures that might appear there but it's really not clear mm. in terms of a test if he's passed the test to upload those pictures yeah, yeah, yeah. and so he's working out we see him doing crunches sure, and yeah. his mother is like what the hell are you doing uh -huh. and he's constantly running Yes. In fact, the last yes. scene of the film as is running, and I would say his problem at this point in terms of coming into his own is that he's he wants he's identified too much with Tom Cruise, because Tom Cruise is the best runner in all of mainstream Hollywood. That's what we want to see him do. If Tom Cruise is not running in a film, it's not a Tom Cruise film. And you know, so, I never made a connection. That's fascinating. But, yeah, he's yes. constantly, constantly running. And I think for Tom Cruise, it's like running away from something in his own uh -huh. identity uh -huh. complex. Uh, so um, that's, that's, I'm just going to leave you with that. We don't have to talk about it. But we're going to open things Fabulous, up. Fabulous, um, delicious. Thank to, you. Um, two questions of any sort for John Woo. So. Yes. Hi, Dr. Kim. Hello. Uh, so I know you taught um, the Picturing Asian America class last semester. So I was wondering if you could just like further talk about, I don't know if you wrote this in your book, but how the sort of Asian American identity of the main character in the short film sort of affects his identity as um, like um, a gay man, I'm assuming. I haven't watched the full short film, but just like, I mean, it, um, Asian men are perceived like very differently in the community as well. So I, I'm just wondering if you had any like further thoughts on that. Good question. She was in the class. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I can answer the question fully, but I can say this, I think, for now, which is that intersectionally, um, and it, it always happens, but we tend to imagine as if we're talking about sexuality in the human universal, which is such a mistake. Um, but when the, the racial dimension enters discussions of gender and sexuality, uh, something entirely uh, complex and quite difficult um, takes place. Um, quite a few scholars have discussed Asian masculinity in uh, the United States and the, how it becomes slippery, the, the normative notions of uh, what a man is, what a man is like, all that becomes very uh, shaky, challenging, even contradictory when it comes to uh, the racial other in American popular consciousness. So some of the uh, frictions and ruptures that you see in the film uh, could be not simply in relation to uh, sexual identity, but also it's, it's uh, compounding, it's intersection with um, racial identity as well. In American film is John Huston's Reflections in a Golden Eye, which is so, the masculinity is, the white masculinity is so fraught and the need for this punishingly cruel but important gay Asian male kind of houseboy to Elizabeth Taylor is, is, like one of the places I would go to in terms of American film to kind of think through why this is here and um, and what it's doing mm -hmm. in terms of that figure's body 
Elizabeth Taylor's body as mm -hmm. mediating figures between Marlon Brando and, and um, Forster. Or, yeah. Eye opening, taking notes. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure I exactly understand the, like, benefit to narcissism. So I think you described it as like a psychological mindset to distinguish the object from the subject. Um, so my question is, can you explain sure. what the object and the subject is and then give an example of how narcissism can be used by someone? Good, good for you, thank you, thanks for the question. So like, you know, in our everyday parlance, you know, narcissism is about like vanity, like you're so self-absorbed, you know? But um, narcissism in psychology, um, psychoanalysis, uh, is about ability to distinguish oneself uh, from the outer objects, things that are external to us, you know, um, like um, it's tied to Lacanian mirror uh, stage or Ovid's, uh, uh, you know, fabulation of um, um, narcissists. Um, and the way I read narcissism is that narcissistic person thinks of themselves intrinsic in the external world. So the skin does not mark the termination of our selfhood, but I am here, but I'm also, let's say, in the bottle of a Coke. I'm in the chair you're sitting in. You know, I'm in the world. And, and, and so that this almost uh, dreamlike, you know, um, feeling of uh, being one with the world, you know, is the way I think about narcissism. So not, it's not something negative, it's actually uh, very um, expansive, even I can perhaps even say democratic way of a being in the world. I would say it's also just right now, given, you know, since the golden escalator ride down into the hell we are in, you know, that there's, you want to differentiate in terms of thinking narcissism from monomania, um, because I think even though the former president is clearly has vicious narcissistic tendencies, he's also a monomaniac, mm -hmm. and those are not the same thing. Right. So. No. Yeah. That that that's not the kind of a narcissism that I'm speaking of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a way, in the way that I talk about narcissism in the book, you should read the book, but in the way I talk about narcissism, it's about selflessness because it's, it's about that, like the melting of the boundary of the notion of a fixed, fixed selfhood that is suggested through this, my perverse reading of a narcissism. Um, I have a question. <laughs> um, why was it important to write this book for you? Okay. <laughs> this was this was the first book I wanted to write. This is the um, dissertation I wanted to write, but I didn't I didn't feel like I was ready, you know. And I think that I, um, the journey I took, you know. Um, since my first book and the edited volume and different essays and teaching in different places um, gave me enough to actually tackle this because I had to do some, um, I don't know, like strategic thinking about how to frame the work, you know, how do I uh, talk about like, you know, the white gay male bodies without uh, losing on the site of who I am and my history, you know, and the kind of decolonial awakening only came in recent years for me, you know, and um, I think that this book is, in a way, I'm, I'm talking to myself, you know, the book, you know, I'm, I'm writing it for myself, Primary, first, foremost, I'm, I, I'm glad I'm sharing it with all of you, but I was also writing it for myself because it was a way of, 
my own investigation. This was my way of trying to figure things out, to figure out how to be in this world, you know, meaningfully and beautifully, yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thank you, Bruce. Um, I often forget to take picture of my audience. I'm going to take a picture shamelessly. So try to look like there's something amazing is about to happen. Okay, okay. And one, two, three. One, two, three. One more. This goes on my social media. Give me a big gestures. Okay. One, two, three. Okay, okay. Selfie. Okay. Last one. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs>